Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Hey, and welcome to Beaverton Peaks. I am your host, DJ Beaver, and this is All Things Twin Peaks, a Twin Peaks commentary. And today we're going to be talking about Twin Peaks and the way Season 2 ended. So if you've never seen Twin Peaks, the original series run from 1990 to 91, then you need to check out because they will, there will be definite spoilers for anyone that's never seen the show before. I got a very special guest with us tonight, and it's my twin brother. Everybody, please say hello to Joe Guidry. Hey, hey Joe. Hey, brother, what's going on? And I'm glad you're doing a show about the greatest TV show that's ever aired and the most anticipated TV show of all time in my life, which would be Twin Peaks. 25 years later. Yeah, it's so funny. We never thought we would get Twin Peaks Season 3, and uh, we both went so far as to create our own storyboards. I I thought it would be neat to see the X-Files in Twin Peaks and uh, did a little storyboard based on that. It was 25 years later in my rehashing of Twin Peaks, and uh, yours was more based on uh, the books and novels and tapes and characters... The, the, twin, the world of Twin Peaks. Yeah, yours started the day after uh, Season 2 ended. Mine started actually 25 years later. But we don't have to create our own storylines anymore because we are going to be getting a Season 3 Twin Peaks 25 years later on Showtime in 2016 or 2017. David Lynch and Mark Frost will return. They've written a script. We don't know if it's going to be nine episodes, 12 episodes, 18 episodes. We're going to see a lot of familiar faces. We're going to have a lot of questions answered. First of all, I wanted to ask you, since you are the foremost authority when it comes to Twin Peaks, if there is an authoritative figure, anyone that's ever watched the show can fall in that category. First of all, I wanted to ask you uh, about recapturing the essence of what was Twin Peaks in 1990 and 91. Is it possible for David Lynch and Mark Frost to recapture Twin Peaks? It's possible. I think that if the show remains the same, uh, I think the show it couldn't be dated. And what I mean by that was there wasn't a lot of a lot of music or a lot of technology that was featured in the show that you could watch and say, you know, this show was definitely made in the early '90s because these things give it away. The show was an oddity. You know, there were jukeboxes playing music by Angelo Badalamente, which, of course, uh, his music is far from what's, you know, popular. And other things like payphones and stuff like that. 25 years later, we could see all of the inventions and, and, and what's modern now. We could see all of that in Twin Peaks. And I think that Twin Peaks fans shouldn't get too deterred by that because it's been 25 years and a lot of stuff could happen. However, my opinion is you keep the jukebox playing Angelo Badalamente, you keep the payphone, you don't have plot devices that that would involve these other technologies like uh, cell phones and stuff like that. Those things drive me crazy when I'm watching a show and the whole plot device is, I can't get a hold of somebody because I can't get a signal, stuff like that. To me, it takes away from, you know, the plot point of the show the point the point of the real drama of the show and so so i wouldn't expect lynch and frost to introduce too much new technology because it would date the third season and the other two seasons weren't dated however uh, like you mentioned before in your first video if the double r diner is uh, a wi-fi then uh, i think the rest of us fans need to roll with it so we won't be seeing coop texting diane uh he'll still be talking in his old school tape recorder or will he be uh talking to diane via skype that's totally up to mark frost and david lynch and i think that the fans of twin peaks know that in their hands whatever they whatever they create it's the the creation I believe um, if we did see Cooper Skyping Diane, we wouldn't see the computer screen. We still wouldn't see Diane. He would be, she would be Skyping facing the camera, and we still wouldn't see who Diane is. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, it's completely up to Lynch and Frost, and, and if they decide to use some of these new technologies as, as plot devices, I think the fans of Twin Peaks will be forgiving. But, you know, we got we to gotta wait and see. To me, I, I don't care. I, I think it would be funny if Cooper would use a tape recorder and 
for Albert to make some, you know, comment like, uh, what's she going to listen to it on, Coop? Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Get I mean, to... you can go that route, you know, you can make fun of the fact that they're thrown back. I mean, anything they want to do, yeah, I'm, I would be cool with it. I don't have a phobia when it comes to changing the style of Twin Peaks. It's 25 years later. I mean, this, this thing could have the mood of Fire Walk With Me because it's on Showtime now, because it's going to air on Showtime. It originally aired on ABC. You know, you couldn't get away with too much, and I think Twin Peaks did push the envelope in that area, and a lot of fans of Twin Peaks weren't happy with Fire Walk With Me, and, and I think it's the greatest film of all time. I didn't compare it to the series while I was watching it and saying, oh my goodness, Bob, Bobby said a curse word. Oh no, uh, Twin, the world of Twin Peaks is destroyed. You know, I didn't feel that way. I watched the film as a film. I love David Lynch's movies. And I personally think it's the greatest movie ever made. It's my favorite movie of all time. Twin Peaks is my favorite TV show of all time. Fire Walk With Me is my favorite movie. I, I trust Lynch. In the in the in the second season of Twin Peaks on ABC, the the death of Maddie, what it, it's still some pretty strong stuff. Uh, what went down for that episode was dark. It's definitely you still don't see stuff like that on ABC or the uh, top three broadcast networks today. That was some some serious, seriously heavy stuff. And and we usually associate mystical and weird with David Lynch, but Mark Frost. He put his two cents in, too, when it came to Twin Peaks and kind of the mystical lore of the town, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of what he had done since Twin Peaks, but I did read about some of it. The, the, only, the only thing that I remember watching TV culturally, uh, Hill Street Blues... I remember when the superhero was introduced, the guy, you know, he wasn't a real superhero, but he was a, a crime-fighting guy, and he wore a costume, and he pretended to be a superhero. That was a Mark Frost character. Those things are, uh, those things are goofy, you know, they're, they're a little weird, they're a little out there, and, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I, I feel like David Lynch and Mark Frost sit up hours a night talking and laughing about, hashing out these characters and their rationales, and, and the fact that they're weird, I don't think they're, for the sake of being weird, I think that Mark Frost and David Lynch are just a couple of really weird guys and you know if it if it is a, a creative device it's not just a shock for shock they want to create something different like the scene you talked about with in twin peaks when maddie maddie is murdered there's far more blood on, on fx with american horror story now you know than, than there was in that scene with twin peaks but the but the shock shock level was there and it definitely wasn't just for the sake of shock it was uh telling the story and showing as much as you can on on a prime time network so now you have Showtime, and when they decide to tell a story like that, it, it, it could very well reflect a lot of the images of Fire Walk With Me. There's one thing that, that can't happen without Mark Frost, and that's character development. David Lynch has never really been, um, that's not one of his strong suits. And uh, I believe the the great character development we had with all of the weird cast of characters in the original Twin Peaks leans heavy on Mark Frost. I, I think of it as George Lucas doing a Star Wars movie without Lawrence Kasdan. Without yeah. Mark Frost, David Lynch, I think, would be a, a babe in the woods, and we would have more of a Fire Walk With Me style. But with Mark Frost, I'm really interested to see what his novel is going to be like, especially because you don't want to give away too much. 25 years later, there are going to be some plot points that pop up that we're going to be like, oh, I wish I could have seen that instead of having to read about it. But um, you do have to bridge the gap. And Mark Frost's book is coming out, I believe, in early 2016. And I'm salivating at the mouth waiting for this book to come out. Oh, yeah. Yes. The book is going to be uh, what original fans of the series wanted was a third season, you know, real time third season. They didn't get it. Uh, all of the actors are now two and a half decades older, and it would be a real quagmire, I think, for them to try to explain what has happened in the last 25 years in the first couple of episodes of the third season. I think, uh, you know, and if you just start off cold and just drop everybody straight into that, that would be interesting to me where you don't know anything at all, but to rehash everything it would take so much time and the, the truth of the matter is the fans of Twin Peaks want those mysteries solved and they know a lot of those mysteries wouldn't take 25 years to solve so to me not like Star Wars where they come out with cartoons and books and games and everything else and, and it's just a continuation of this huge world it's, it's not like that I think the book would be very special it would be in the world of Twin Peaks it would be a part of Twin Peaks. It would be a necessary part of Twin Peaks if, if you are a huge fan. And I, I like it. 
I think part of the reason why Lynch backed out uh, from doing the, the third season for a while and then came back in was to be able to get his ideas into this book, to make sure that whichever direction Mark Frost was going, that, that Lynch would be completely on board. And uh, not to mention that he probably wanted more than just eight episodes and nine episodes to tell the story, the final story. I think the book had a lot to do with it, and I think the book's going to be important for fans. Now, there's a lot of plot lines that, like you said, that will be answered in the novel that we're not going to we're not going to be able to see it on screen and i want to touch on some of them again if you didn't see twin Peaks season one or season two you need to check out because we're about to talk about some of the um especially the finale and just some of the things that were going on with the characters at the end of season two things that'll probably be answered in the novel and we might as well just start off with the bank explosion audrey horn pete martell andrew packer they were all in the bank now Pete Martell and Andrew Packard, the um, the actors that played those two characters, the actors have unfortunately passed away. So I really believe they they will die in the explosion. But of course, Audrey's got to be alive. Yeah, I think so. And I think I think part of that is her being chained to that to that door, that savings and loan deal door. You know, in my in my mind, the building blew up and and you know the door flew and landed, and she was on top of it, and she might have suffered a few bruises or whatever. But she was able to. I don't know. You know, I don't know how they're going to figure it out. In my mind, Audrey has to have survived the explosion. I'm sure Lynch and Frost had a third season, you know, in mind, a continuation. A lot of these plot devices were, of course, you know, cliffhangers, almost apocalyptic, forcing the network to continue the series. Of course, ABC didn't. They blundered just about everything as far as Lynch is concerned. Well, I like uh, the end of season one. The end of season one, it was just so much going on. And, and they've actually come out and said, yeah, we wanted as many cliffhangers as possible because they didn't know if they were going to have a season two. Right, and I think it turned out... I think it turned out well. I can see what problem people have with the second season, the inconsistencies of it all. From my perspective and my point of view, I found it enthralling. I, I thought that these characters were developing in, in odd ways, and I, I, I would get excited to see the next episode. And, you know, no, 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 investigating into how all of that came to be while it was on TV, you know, I realized, yeah. Lynch was doing some things, Frost was doing some things, and, you know, you had writers like Harley Payton and, and Robert Ingalls coming up with these, some of these plot devices and also, you know, Mark Frost having a bigger stamp on it than Lynch. And I could see why the, 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 the real fans would complain about it, but, but not from my perspective. From my perspective, I thought it was very, very interesting. It definitely wasn't like anything else that was on TV. You know, for this woman, like uh, Nadine, for instance, being in a coma and then waking up and thinking she's an uh, 18-year-old, waking up with superhuman strength. That sounds like something Mark Ross would write. And I loved it. I thought it was amazing. I couldn't wait to see what she was going to do next. You know, I don't know. Maybe when you have to wait a week to watch the next episode and then you have to wait a week to watch the next episode, maybe after a while you do get frustrated when something goofy like that, like that happens. Instead of something you're really waiting for, like, you know, the, uh, explaining what Bob really is or, or where's Wyndham Murrow at this time or whatever, whatever anybody might have been, might have been wondering. Now, you were talking about Nadine, so we're going to go with uh, that. That's our next plot line we're going to talk about. Big Ed, Nadine, and Norma Jennings. Big Ed and Nadine are still together at the end of season two, but Big Ed is clearly in love with Norma, and uh, Hank is in jail. So uh, what do you think in season three? Is Big Ed still going to be with Nadine? Has he moved on? Is he with Norma? And is Hank still in jail, or is he on parole? (laughs) I think 25 years is perfect time limit for Hank to have served his time, and I think a, a good device in the third season would be that Hank's about to get on parole again, or, 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 or he might be released from jail. And, you know, it, that's one of the beginnings of the original series, and I think that's one of the consistencies that would, that would I think some of the fans would actually like. They might complain about it now, but it's a familiarity. You know, Hank being Norma's husband and having all these bad ideas, and, and the fact that he might be you know released from prison. I think Big Ed said it best when he said, well, when you're Sweetheart's husband's in the slammer for manslaughter. The word parole's got a nasty ring to it. (laughs) So is Big Ed with Nadine still? I think that at the last episode of season two, Ed and Norma were ready. They had been together for for a while. You know, Nadine was was courting one of the kids in school, Mike. And Nadine snapped out of her delusion of being 18 years old at that very last episode, realizing that her husband, Big Ed, was with Norma. And I remember Nadine saying in that last episode, it's not fair, it's not fair. Now, the thing you got to remember about Big Ed is he's been with, with Nadine his whole life. 
basically out of sympathy for her and feeling obligated to, to take care of her. So I think uh, when you go from the second season into the book, Big Ed is probably going to cater to, to Nadine because he feels that responsibility to take care of her. And I think that Norma is just going to be sitting around waiting like she, like she always has. She's waited around for him for 20 years, and she's going to have to wait around for him until you know he figures out what to do with her. You know, I, if I was Norma, I'd get tired of it. All right, and what about Mike? Uh, I'd pretty much think that Mike would get over it. He did say he loved Nadine in the last episode, right or right towards the end of the season. Then uh, he'll get over it. Yeah, he'll get over it. You know, we never really heard. We, we were under the impression that Mike enjoyed Nadine's company because of the super se- super strength and and her sexuality. <laughs> but uh, I think those things an 18 year old can get over pretty quickly. You know, if he is in a funk, he'd probably try to get back with Donna. That's a good jumping off point. Donna Hayward could be the daughter of Benjamin Horn. And that last scene in, in the Hayward living room with Ben Horn and uh, Doc Hayward and Donna. Do you think Ben is really Donna's father? Yeah, you kind of got the impression that Benjamin felt like he was the father of Donna. And, you know, the reaction, of course, of Doc Hayward, who had raised Donna his whole life, you know, he was very, very aggravated in those last few episodes because at the time, Ben Horn was trying to to be a better person and to do the right thing. And so obviously he sold on the fact that Donna's his child. We never got an official DNA result. And I think that's going to have to come into the book now. If if Mark Cross and Lynch write in the book that it is proven that Benjamin Horn is the father of Donna, you also got to think about the the will and how you know Audrey was able to to assume control of the uh, of the Horn dynasty because uh, everything that Horn has is going to be left to his children. And the only other child besides Donna is Johnny. And Johnny has mental issues, so you would assume Audrey would get everything. When you prove that Donna is is actually Benjamin's daughter, then then she would be an heir to that. It's like half of Twin Peaks or whatever. She'd be entitled yeah. to half. Yeah, she'd be entitled to have it. So uh, you know, the, the book could explain you know how we're going to incorporate Donna into this situation. And and when the series starts, when season three starts, you just may have Audrey and Donna running the businesses, running the Great Northern, running the Horns Department Store, you know, stuff like that. Will we see? Donna, 25 years later, Donna Hayward, is she going to be like the Donna of season one or the Donna that was trying to be bad girl in season two? The, uh, the shades, she, as soon as she put on Loris shades, uh, she, became a, 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 she became a target for Bob. Uh, uh, Laura always said, don't wear any of my stuff. Donna puts on the glasses and starts smoking cigarettes and uh, hanging out with uh, Laura's boyfriend, you know, James. You know, secret boyfriend, you know, it was obvious Donna was trying to be Laura, and that was setting it up for the audience to feel like Donna would be the next victim. And, and that leads me to um, to the two the two actresses that played Donna, Laura Flynn Boyle, and in Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me, Moira Kelly. My opinion's always been if Moira Kelly is going to be playing Donna in season three, that she would be more of the nice girl. And if Laura Flynn Boyle comes back to play Donna, then I could see how she um, maybe maybe be a uh, um, more like her father, Ben Horn. Right, right, exactly. That's it. Uh, she was she was heading down that path, and we were told often that James Hurley would have been the guy that could have taken Laura out of that darkness. He could have been the guy that showed her the love that she needed to get her off of the drugs and to give her some hope in her life. And James and Donna, they just couldn't mesh. And I think because James really didn't care for Donna that much, he he was able to get on his bike and take off because he had to think about things because Maddie died. So I don't think that James would be the saving grace for Donna. I mean, he could. He would be able to fulfill that role. He never could save Laura, but he could save Donna. But I think I think you made a good point about Laura Flynn Boyle. You bring Laura Flynn Boyle back. If it's proved that, that Benjamin Horn is her father, and then she starts getting involved in that business, yeah, I could see where it would lead to corruption for her. Maybe Mike can learn to write a poem, and uh, he could be Donna's saving grace, but that's probably <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> I always had this thought, and this is not a spoiler because I know nothing, but I always thought Benjamin Horn would end up being uh, in a wheelchair, kind of like kind of like Johnny. His mental state would be closer to Johnny, and they could have a real kinship, father and son drooling off in the corner while, while Audrey and Donna are running the Great Northern. 
yeah, there's a lot of yeah, that's a lot of plot device there. You know, they, they would talk, speak a lot about the problems in society today too with misogyny and all that. You know, not to not to make an example of Johnny and his condition, but you say Benjamin in that condition as well because the last episode of season two, Doc Hayward gets mad at Benjamin Horn because he's trying to reveal that he's Donna's real father, and Doc Hayward attacks Benjamin Horn. He, he pushes him. Benjamin Horn hits his head on the fireplace mantel, and he's laying on the ground bleeding from the head, and that, that's the last you see of Benjamin Horn. So that kind of injury can go either way. We could see Doc Hayward imprisoned for assault or, or you know, the, uh, eventually, you know, manslaughter or whatever in case Horn dies. But I think Horn lives. I think he recovers from his injuries. I don't think those injuries were, were too major. It's up to Lynch and Frost. Those Ouch. could have been some of the sticking points, you know. Maybe maybe Frost wanted uh, Benjamin Horn to be uh, paraplegic or, or something like that, and maybe Lynch didn't want it, or maybe Lynch really wanted it. And, you know, Mark Frost had wrote Benjamin Horn reverting back to the dark side, right, and uh, being a bad guy again. Yeah, that's, that's up to Frost and Lynch, and I think it's going to be... Uh, going to be very interesting and exciting and whichever way they go with it i'm completely on board but maybe none of the horn family would be able to take care of johnny 25 years later so he'll be in a, a mental hospital and this is just again i'm you know wishing and dreaming every night like we have been for 25 years but <laughs> i would like to see sarah palmer in a mental institution in a room with johnny and like figuring out all the all the mysteries of twin peaks just figuring it out on their own and no one's paying attention to them because they're cuckoo <laughs> that is so cool i love that idea okay let's talk about um shelly and bobby and leo we have another love triangle in the world of Twin Peaks. I didn't care for the Bobby plot point working with Audrey and, and being at the Great Northern. It took him out of his element, which was, you know, I, I really like Bobby and Shelley and their relationship. And Leo, when last we saw him, was hanging on for dear life with his teeth, literally with a, a, a basket of tarantulas above his head. Is Leo alive in season three? Definitely. I definitely think so. You know, there's there's one thing about the mythology of how, how Twin Peaks ended and how it would evolve. Fire Walk With Me added a bunch of that because, you know, they, they added some, some elements that weren't in the original series. And, you know, a lot of people that are fans of the show, you know, feel strongly one way or the other about it. I think that Leo is still alive. What I believe is that Cooper, Agent Cooper, physical alive agent cooper there's only one he comes out physically comes out from the other place and uh you know, big spoiler alert yeah we've already we've already told you you know coop looks in the mirror and he sees bob's reflection and you get this 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 uh suggestion from fire walk with me and i call it a suggestion you get the suggestion that there's actually a good dale in the other place that's trapped that needs to be saved well, I don't believe that a physical body can split into two different beings. You have the one body, and Cooper's good. I think that what Lynch was saying was, the Cooper that's running around now is corrupt, and the only way you can get Bob out of him is to re-enter the lodge, as, as, as people call it, the, the lodge. You know, I think the white lodge and the black lodge, you, the same entrance, you enter one with love, and a lot of training, like uh, like Major Briggs spoke about, or you you enter with fear, and it's a, it's like an acid trip. It's a totally different acid trip. You surround yourself in, in, with a good feeling, a good good mindset, and you're going to have a good time. Or you surround yourself with negativity and fear, and you're going to have a horrible time. I think that Wyndham Merle is still alive. I think that our killer, Bob, can now inhabit Wyndham anytime he wants. I think Bob's been able to inhabit Wyndham for a long time. When, when Wyndham Merle worked on Project Blue Book, I think that got him closer to the evil that he was looking for, and he didn't even realize it. So I think, yes, I think, Bob, I think Wyndham's going to be alive, and that Bob can inhabit him at any time. And I think that Cooper's going to be alive, and Bob can, can inhabit him at any time. So with that in mind... You've got Wyndham Merle coming out of the lodge. You've got Bob inside of him. And he's going to go straight back to that cabin to go get his little helper, to go get Leo, who's recovering from a, from a coma himself. And he's trying to put all the pieces together, and, and Leo will be easily manipulated. And, I, you know, I'm not sure what's 
happened in the last 25 years, but I think that that would be a good way to go. I think that Leo should be a threat, and, and, and not just a because he's a jerk, but because he could have the ultimate evil in him as well. Maybe, maybe, maybe Leo survived the tarantulas, and he's been in jail, and he's going to be getting paroled with Hank. Or, um, like you say, that's the big question. Uh, Dale Cooper, is he possessed by Bob? Is he running around as Bob for 25 years? That is really one of the major questions that fans are going to be wanting to an- answer in Season 3, and that's the one I, I really, I'm not going to dwell on it, because everyone makes great points. Is the good Dale running around in the acid trip called the Black Lodge for 25 years? Maybe time isn't 25 years for him. Maybe it's just a week. Or like you said, you know, maybe he just like Leland, he just forgot. He didn't know when Bob was taking over. Maybe Agent Cooper could be solving murders that he committed unknowingly. (laughs) For 25 years, he's running around trying to solve murders that Bob, that he, he himself committed yeah I think that's a gr- that's one way they could do it and I think that that's, that's one way that they could kill a lot of the 25 years that have passed is that when we finally see Cooper again we're not going to know what we're getting and if we get this calculated detective who, who can be possessed by Bob at any time I mean he, he would make a, a, an excellent villain but that goes against the beauty of the original show Cooper with his wide-eyed wonder of nature and and he used to get so excited about trivial things or what some people might think are just the little things snowshoe you know, just, rabbit ducks on the lake <laughs> oh that now season three is going to be <laughs> skype <laughs> That See, that, to me, evolving Twin Peaks to today's time could be such a great plot device. Cooper, like you, now you suggested this before, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but, but for Dale Cooper to finally come back to reality, to have his amazement and wonder, focus on the advancements in technology, because he's been stuck in this room with, with, with curtains for 25 years, and you know, it might have just seemed like a second to him. And when he comes out, he's like, my goodness, cell phones. <laughs> Who would have known? Starbucks. Oh my! This must be where coffee goes when it dies. <laughs> He's talking about the flavor now. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about uh, this must be where coffee goes when you throw it in the dumpster. Yeah, I like Starbucks. But anyway, uh, yeah, there's so many new things that could be involved, and in, in the wonder and awe. You know, that's another thing. You know, we, we really want to see. The Cooper of old. Well, the Cooper of old, he shows up in Twin Peaks, far removed from his life as a federal agent in Philadelphia. I'd rather be here than Philadelphia. Okay, so so he was in awe of this beauty. He shows back up in Twin Peaks 25 years later. You know, he may still hold some of the, you know, the, the, how he cherishes nature and and the simple beauties. But some of that will be lost, especially if if he's a villain. Yeah, he needs Twin to go Peaks. fly fishing. Yeah, yeah, he needs to go. He needs to go on a fly fishing trip. Oh, is Major Briggs alive? Is Major Briggs, uh, the the actor Don Davis, has passed away? And I do want to touch on some of the actors that have passed away. I mean, central characters to the world of Twin Peaks. Personally, I think Major Briggs could be in the White Lodge, and we haven't seen him for 25 years. And so his character would still be alive, but we would never get another actor playing him. It would it just, he, this case, he just, uh, he's been gone for 25 years and no one's seen him. Yeah, Major Briggs. You know, at the at the end of the second season, Major Briggs was really the head of the cavalry. You know, he was the lead. He was the one that was going to lead the charge to go and save Cooper. So this book could focus a lot on that. It could focus on Major Briggs' efforts to, to rescue Cooper. Uh, okay, about this recasting thing. You mentioned major characters. The original actors are now deceased. Bob, the killer, played by Frank Silva. Frank Silva is no longer with us. Uh, Catherine E. Coulson is no longer with us. She played the log lady. You have these major characters in the lore of Twin Peaks that I don't think Twin Peaks as it was could exist without those characters. So you, you would have to recast them. You really would. I mean, are we just going to all of a sudden, 25 years later, create a new nemesis for the entire show. I believe Lynch could create one very easily because he's brilliant, especially if he has a team like he had before, Patricia Norris with the costumes and stuff. You know, that blue jean jacket and the fact that Bob's hair was long and gray, the distinct look of, of Frank Silver. But those things were creepy. It's even creepier when you get somebody like David Lynch to do it, you know, put him at the edge of the bed, you know, have him in the corner, have him staring right at you, walking around slowly and stuff. I'm not afraid of having a 
a new Bob. I'm not afraid of a, a new nemesis completely, but I think people want Bob. Now, do you cast Bob as someone who looks like Frank Silva, or do you cast recast Bob completely? I think maybe Bob and the the arm, which is Michael J. Anderson, could, could infuse together, and we'll get Brad Dorff. <laughs> I love that idea. I think that Brad Dorff would make an excellent Bob. I know people love Frank Silva, and I do too, and I don't want anybody else but Frank Silva, but we're not going to get him. The only way we're going to get him is if you computer enhance. If you place Bob's image into season three digitally, there's probably going to be fans that don't like that either. There's going to be fans that might see a recast of Bob and, and wish they had Frank Silva's image instead. I think you make a great point. After 25 years, there could be some, some changes or just recast him completely. I mean, Brad Dorff playing Bob would be brilliant. And he could still be Bob or he could be, you know, the merger of the arm and Bob or whatever. <laughs> Bob's <Yeah>. brother. <laughs> well, a lot of fans are also saying, oh, instead of uh, Frank Silva, you'll see Ray White. Yeah, I like that idea, too. You know, you'd have to work it into the book and explain it to the people how that works. The character of Leland Palmer, how much effect is he going to have at all? I mean, he's deceased, so he's, well, he's in the other place. So the only time you will see Ray Wise, one of the greatest actors of all time, here, here. the only way you'll ever see him in the series is in those scenes in another place. and Maybe Sarah Palmer will be seeing him in Visions. Yep, uh, yep that was in my fan fiction, too. I think that that's, that that's great, the whole, the whole uh, uh, apparitions and, and uh, are they ghosts, you know? Are, are, are you just seeing Visions? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, scare I, I the hell out of me. I definitely see Ray Wise walking around as the embodiment of, of Bob. All right, so do you recast the Log Lady? I think the Log Lady is really important. The um, problem is it was so true to Catherine Coulson and David Lynch. That's a character that should be mentioned and should be revered and spoken about. Uh, that would be a, a good way to start season three, is uh, for the townsfolk to be attending the funeral of, of Margaret Lannerman, the log lady. <clears throat> and then you can start to reveal, you know, whatever similarities are, are about her husband's passing or are he's missing. And my impression was always from Fire Walk With Me, Jurgen Pranchnow. I always thought that Jurgen Pranchnow's character in Fire Walk With Me was actually the log lady's husband. He's credited as the woodsman. He's but, such uh, a great actor. I, if, if they would have a funeral for the log lady, I would hope he is standing there off to the side by a tree at his wife's funeral. And we would get uh, that character, that new old character. Yeah, yeah. Talk about bringing, you know, the anthology of, of Twin Peaks right in the book. I'm thinking in the book, Major Briggs leads the cavalry, goes in there to try to save Cooper. And as a direct result of that, there are others that are trapped there could, could be uh, released. And I'm not just talking about Jurgen Pranchnow or the log lady's husband. I'm also talking about Agent Philip Jeffries and Agent Chet Desmond. Desmond. Yeah. I mean, those guys, I think that's a very important point. As a matter of fact, that could be your whole plot device for the third season. If Cooper, if somebody can get Cooper's head out of the lodge and he becomes comes back to reality that is the perfect case for him it is now up to me to, to to save these guys it's now up to me to find out where they're at and to figure this out you know once you save cooper from bob uh, i guess you you learn enough to to save everybody from it that's another thing that needs to be brought up will cooper remain possessed for you know lack of a better term will he remain possessed for the entire third season will we get uh, the ultimate end, saving Coop, will we get that pushed off to the side, or will that be solved immediately? What do you think? I think Coop's been possessed for 25 years. He's married to... Annie Blackburn. Oh, Annie. Yeah, Annie Cooper. And uh, they have kids, and uh, she knows something ain't right with her husband. <laughs> and those kids would be, uh, you know, anywhere from teenage years to, to up to 25 years. So uh, pretty sure that a Bob infested Cooper would have become very familiar with his children. Well, that, that's a good point. Now, the kids, uh, there's going to be new characters in season three, and a lot of people just want the old characters, but just like the new Star Wars movie that's coming out, you're going to get some new characters, and they're going to slap a Skywalker on. It, it, you're going to find out that they're the children of Luke or Leia. So any new characters we have, if they have the last name of a character from Twin Peaks, we will immediately be invested in care and care about these characters. Well, let's start off with the ones we know 
And that's uh, Andy and Lucy. Yes, they are definitely having a baby. Is this kid going to, is he going to be smart? I think he's going to be a, a deputy. I think he's going to follow in his father's footsteps. He's going to try to do the right thing. And you are going to get Andy 2.0. And hopefully he's brilliantly cast. And since Johanna Ray is the casting director, I know he's going to be brilliantly cast. And I can't wait to see the kids. You know, every time there's a, a an announcement of somebody else added to the to the cast of season three, I get excited about all of it. I really do, because I have such faith in Johanna Ray. Now, Amanda Seyfried, she's definitely going to be in season three. And when I look at her, I see uh, Heather Graham. I see Annie Blackburn. But a lot of other people have, have suggested that it, it would be the daughter of Andy and Lucy. Right, Andy and Lucy were the ones that were pregnant at the time. But you you, you mentioned another point uh, two nights ago about, about, well, perhaps some of these characters, like Shelley, maybe, maybe she was pregnant the whole time. We, we None of it was revealed. It's very conceivable that, it's very conceivable that, because Twin Peaks only lasted 30 days, 29 episodes, and each episode, almost every episode was just one day and night. So it's possible she... Um, Mr. Period, and, you know, so she yeah, would have never, a 25-year-old. Never, never put two and two together. Okay, Amanda Seyfried, to me, she looks like a child of Annie Blackburn and, and Dale Cooper. But she could also be a, a long-lost relative. They love to do that, you know. You go for days and days with Twin Peaks, and all of a sudden, Norma says, my sister Annie's coming. She just got out of the convent. So, you know, yeah, Amanda Seyfried could be a, a, a child from, you know, someone else that's not in the show or just a relative or, or, or something like that. I'm excited about seeing the young people. I really am. That was a big part of Twin Peaks. The, the original series of Twin Peaks, there was daytime and there was nighttime. In the daytime, you got all the plain Jane stuff. You got all the physical evidence. You know, The people, soap opera stuff. People, yeah, that, that, the, the character development, soap opera, it was daytime drama, it was children at the school, it was their issues, it was uh, Cooper finding the tangible evidence, and then nighttime would come, and the whole world of Twin Peaks would be turned upside down, and that's another uh, possible duality of season three. The daytime could be like old Twin Peaks, and the nighttime could be like Fire Walk with yeah, it's so interesting you mentioned that. It's, uh, it's something that never occurred to me was, you know, every episode was, almost every episode was one day and night. And and it really did flip a switch like David Lynch loves to do. But yeah, yeah, the, the days of our lives, young and the restless type of Twin Peaks that we got fed you for almost an hour of the episode. And then we would get nighttime and we would get uh, something of the the plot device that we've been kind of hanging around waiting for. It would grab you. It would choke you. It would be, it's not like, oh, can we please get on with it? But I mean, just that little taste at the end of, of each episode was uh, the darkness. The, the the fire walk with me side of Twin Peaks, if you will. The end of the end of Twin Peaks. Uh, every nighttime before the episode would end would be what everyone was talking about at the water cooler the next day. What in the world was up with that? You know, what in the world was up with the dancing midget? What in the world was up with the fact that they have a killer who's who's identified, and then they have another killer, and they okay, well, who's this Bob guy? And yeah, I, I, I loved it. I love that, and I, I think that that's that's something the fans should expect. Nighttime hits Twin Peaks, like Laura said. Nighttime is my time. That's when the black dogs run. So, do we see Evelyn or not? <laughs> if I had my choice between Evelyn, excuse me, Evelyn. If I had my choice between Evelyn Marsh. And Lana Budding Milford, I would run over Evelyn Marsh in a heartbeat and focus on Lana Budding Milford. I think that the worst part of Twin Peaks ever was when James left town, and yet they still focused on James, trying to get the ratings of all the kids. The kids wanted to see Donna and James. They didn't want to see James and Evelyn Marsh. And Evelyn Marsh had absolutely nothing to do with the show. Nothing. That was kind of like uh, a Lost Highway thing, you know, uh, older woman and... And, and kid and the mechanic and uh, mean older people and I don't know, whatever. I always wanted to see, uh, the first thing I wanted to see in the new Star Wars movie was Jar Jar being, being thrown into a volcano. The Misa on fire! <laughs> but but uh, Evelyn, I, that's what I thought for Twin Peaks. Is like The very first thing we should see is Evelyn. To where everybody's going, oh no, and then she immediately gets killed by the new killer, whoever that may be. I think getting rid of her... It would work on a, on, a, on a different level if we just don't even mention her at all. Because I wouldn't even want to draw attention to her character enough to even 
substantiate the existence of the character, right? You know, if, if her murder is the one that's got to be solved, I don't want to see a picture of Evelyn at the end of every episode. <laughs> I mean, Evelyn. I don't know why I keep calling her Evelyn when her name was obviously Evelyn in the show. Yeah. No, well, that I gives a whole new meaning to the evil that men do. <laughs> I don't want to see her. On the other hand, Lana Budding Milford, you know, who was played by Robin Lively, yeah, Lana could show up and have that obvious control that she had over men. And and be trying to manipulate people, you know. Uh, to, to, just to me, her character has so much more substance than. And we're talking about B characters, okay? We're talking about the characters that that did not have a a main voice in the show. So you brought up Evelyn. I had to bring up Lana <laughs> and her exotic dance. <laughs> I like Kimmy Robinson's dance better during the Twin Peaks pageant. I liked what what Lucy Moran did for her show better than better than what what Lana did. But anyway. Kimmy's so awesome. Yeah, she is awesome. She can always dance, and she's funny and and charming, and and, uh, and that's that's really the thing about Twin Peaks fans. For over the twenty five years, they, they hold a festival in North Bend, Washington, every year. A Twin Peaks festival has been going on for twenty five years, and we were lucky enough to attend the festival in two thousand eleven. And we made a bunch of friends, a bunch of friends that live there, a bunch of people. And these are lifelong friends that you meet over a weekend. Because if you love Twin Peaks, then you're close to me. And and a lot of them, a lot of the characters, a lot of the actors that played uh, characters of Twin Peaks have shown up. And most of the Twin Peaks friends that we've made have met Kimmy Robertson, have met Michael Horse, or Charlotte Stewart, or Russ Tamlin, yeah, and and, and Alistair Bowl. There, there's a love there for these characters. There's a love for the people that played these characters. Yeah, there really is. I've always been a fan of Kimmy. I've always been a fan of of, of Lenny Von Dolan. You know, side characters that that you know, you know, his his character, of course, is deceased. But anyone, any actor who played a character in Twin Peaks that's still alive, whether that character is alive or dead, can show up in the new season because of the woods, because of the existence of another plane and. Uh, and yeah, there's lots of devices. I don't think any real fan of Twin Peaks would argue that, that any of those characters being featured in the new season would be a bad thing. Uh, I would like all of them. I would. I know Hank. You know Hank. You know when when, when Twin Peaks was on, Hank was just a nemesis, and everybody was so mad. And Chris Mulkey did such a great job. And I think that we could have a little Chris Mulkey in a in our show. He should be released, and 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 we should have to deal with that. You know, we should have to deal with Leo. Excellent, excellent, excellent job. I mean, just just when his portrayal of Leo just captured the audience, it really did. He became famous very quickly, for a short time and very quickly, and it's because he was so effective. And Audrey, and, I, and I've got to mention Cheryl and Finn. I uh, know she, she carried that show. Her and Laura Flynn Ball, for, a, for a, a, a big degree, carried that show. What My point being is that everyone that has appeared in Twin Peaks uh, we have a great affinity for it, the fans love and would love to see more of them. Sometimes, you know, you, you, after 25 years of, of wanting something as much as we wanted uh, a third season of Twin Peaks, you know, after a while, after a couple of years, you kind of just, you know, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget about Twin Peaks for a while, okay, because it's, it's depressing. I'm just going to leave it be for a while, get another, you know, football season starts. You watch your favorite football team. You know, maybe uh, every four years there's an election, you get involved in that. But... We always came back to Twin Peaks, and we always came back to Twin Peaks often. And uh, on, on those days when, when I would kind of forget, you would remind me, it is to show the people that get lost, to show them their way. And Fire Walk Me ended that way with Cooper showing Laura the way. It was as if Cooper was always there. You believe that the um, grandson, the magician, you believe that is Coop. Yeah, Coop was the, always the one talking about magic. He was always the one saying, uh, let's use something different. Let's use magic. And then uh, the grandmother says that her grandchild's uh, studying magic. I don't care that the kid that played him had blonde hair. Not, that doesn't matter. To me, it was, uh, it was like Cooper trying to help Cooper out, to show him the way. And the, the way I looked at it was that it was, a, it was always a, a fight between Bob and Cooper. Uh, to win the game, Bob would have to would have to win Cooper's soul, and he did it, and then Coop goes back to the lodge, and then they decide to play another game. You know, maybe Cooper decided that Grandpa Bob cheated, and so let's try it again. Flip-flop back in time, you know, that way. So interesting. That's that's the best part about Twin Peaks, is that everybody's, everybody's got, if they care, everyone's got an opinion, and everybody's opinion is interesting, 
and that's what kept what kept us alive for 25 years when it comes to this uh you know, a lot of people are like, what is the big interest in it? I feel bad for people that go back and watch it on Netflix because it's been hyped up so much that there's down to be a, a letdown for people that have never even heard of it and decide to go see it. It's like, I don't see what the big deal is. It's just like you had to be there. You really had to be there. <laughs> I feel that way about Lost. I don't see what the big deal is. If I go back and watch it, I'm sure I might check out after uh, the first season and just say, I don't see what the big whoop is. It's something that you live. Same thing with American Horror Story. You, you you get involved and you you find the love and and we we live Twin Peaks. We've lived with it for twenty five years. It's kind of waiting for a Super Bowl. You know, it's like when is my team going to win a Super Bowl? It's like when is Twin Peaks going to come back? Is it ever going to come back? You know, twenty five years is a long time. I've had so many exes. You know, in my love for Twin Peaks. I would try to rub off on everyone, and I've had so many friends and, and exes that are like, "Joe, just get over it. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. You need to quit dreaming about it." And lo and behold, it's like a dream come true. That is the best part. Like David Lynch said, "Keep the mystery alive," and that that's the best part is not knowing, and we're about to find out. Season three is is upon us. Heck, we waited 25 years. Another year is is no sweat off my back. Yeah, I could do that standing on my head. Come on, let's go. <laughs> it's going to be a beautiful thing. The real deal is Mark Frost and David Lynch, and that's what they're going to give us. And you mentioned in your last video that it could be Balthasar Getty in a rabbit head standing yeah. in Big Ed's gas farm for 45 minutes, and I would be happy with it. Yes, I would. I would be very happy if the white horse walks up in the first scene and takes a dump you know, the Great Northern or whatever. I don't care. Well, uh, yeah, well, no, we're going to see it. It's going to be a black horse, and we'll just see it in the background for, like, three episodes. <laughs> and everyone's just going to be like, what does it mean? Yeah, what is he? Why is he doing this? Uh, let me see, because his first name is David, and his second name, his last name is Lynch. <laughs> All right, brother, that'll about wrap it up for this episode. I appreciate you coming on this evening, and uh, next time we're going to talk about the movie itself, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. There are a lot of differences in the movie and the show. A little bit of the mythology, I'm just going to mention The Ring, and uh, we'll leave it at that until that episode, and we'll see uh, what fits in, what's going to be incorporated into the new show. But it was, all, it, it was a pleasure talking about the characters from the original series, and I look forward to seeing what exactly David Lynch and Mark Frost do with these characters, with the world of Twin Peaks 25 years later. And uh, once again, uh, DJ Beaver is saying thank you for tuning in to Beaver 10 Peaks. And uh, why don't you say goodbye to everybody, Joe? All right, brother. Take it easy. I'll see you in the trees. Is this thing off? <laughs>